Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand Up. My name is Stu Turley, President CEO of the Sandstone Group. Today is October 22nd. Hold on, it is a rocket ride today. Florida is most gas dependent state in the country. Wow. U.S. electricity demand jump catches power utilities unaware. Imagine that. The energy transition is powered by, wait for it, coal. This one's from Javi Blas from Bloom, uh, Bloomberg. It's a good article. California's energy dilemma and how new laws might spark even higher prices. You got to love that one. Michael and I talked about that on yesterday's show. Qatar faces rising competition in Asia from flexible LNG suppliers. It's going to be uh, pretty dicey out there, but let's roll to Florida's most gas dependent state in the country. This one really kind of caught my attention. It was on LinkedIn and a shout out to Jacob Williams on LinkedIn. I saw this on his posts. And when we take a look at natural gas, natural gas, 40% of natural gas U.S. generation is is the most used in the area. It looks like the chart is showing that 76% is very heavily weighted that it needs natural gas. Natural gas is greater than 50% of generation in the eastern of the U.S. and Gulf Coast and 45 in the southwest in California. California gas is a fundamental source for low cost and reliable power for most of the country. I couldn't agree more with that. And then you take a look at nuclear, nuclear in that same region is only 9% in the Texas area. And then you've got the Southeast area at 29%. But for the United States, 18% of our power comes from nuclear. And for, for us to have such a nuclear, to have such a black eye, could you imagine losing 18% of your ability to produce power, it would be nuts. 14% of the U.S. energy mix from wind and solar is pretty my, uh, mind-blowing to me when you take a look at this chart. The chart is in the Midwest. You look at 24% of the energy mix in Texas Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana is from wind, solar, and that just to me is amazing. And you take a look at the Southeast 4% in there, they really need that natural gas in there. So this article really is telling when you say, wait a minute, are, is everybody using wind? Is everybody using it? No. I'll tell you what, but at what cost? We have spent trillions around the world trying to get to we renewable energy. And we all know that wind and solar is not truly renewable energy because it has to be constantly updated in order to, to maintain the fleet, the wind fleet. So it's pretty interesting there. Let's go to the next story here. U.S. Electric, electricity demand jump catches power utilities unaware. U.S. electricity demand is growing faster than anticipated. Guess why? It's all about data centers and AI. The Inflation Reduction Act boosting U.S. manufacturing and adding electricity demand, but delays in projects and rising electricity costs may hinder further growth. It's called deindustrialization when you add renewable energy to the grid is what it's called. The report cited budgeting data center development, burgoning data center development, a resurgence in U.S. energy intensive manufacturing and great transport and heating electrification to driving electricity demand growth not seen since the 1990s as factors driving demand growth. The firm uh, analysts then point out that while certain uh, rates of demand growth would be welcomed by the power utilities, any faster growth re represents a problem because the necessary upgrades to the grid would take years to bring in plan to the field. 
we have about 24,000 projects be waiting to be approved, to be added to the grid. So the Department of Energy is not helping this out. In the power sector, however, new infrastructure planning takes five to 10 years, and the industry is only now starting to plan for growth, Wood McKenzie's vice chairman of power and renewables, Chris uh, Sapel, said. Meanwhile, demand is growing right now as much as 24 gigawatts in new data center capacity announced in the first half of the year, according to the WoodMac report since January 2023. We have a, this is from Irina Slav at oilprice.com. I'll be talking to her on Thursday this week. So a, again, this is absolutely an outstanding article from Irina. Energy transition is powered by, wait for it, coal. Energy consumption is accelerating faster than renewable resources, which we just did, talked about, can provide for. And it, though the world keeps turning to the dirtiest form of fossil fuels coal king coal is still here i i really like javier um uh, blas from bloomberg he writes an outstanding article under former u.s climate envoy john Kerry. america reached a sort of de detente with china about the energy transition the unwritten deal involved china giving up coal over time with hindsight it feels like beijing played Kerry. Really? Uh, who was desperate for a deal at the time COP26 summit in Glasgow. He got played like a fiddle. It's time for a new approach. The world can't claim moving forward in the right direction until coal consumption has dropped meaningfully, say, to the levels of 2000. On our current trends, that's what's likely to happen until well we're beyond uh, 2050. Let me explain what we've been working on here. That is, we have seen trends over the last four years. Michael and I have been on this podcast, and we have seen the more we go to renewable energy, the more fossil fuels we use. The death of oil and gas is not here yet. De King coal is still going gangbuster, and we are wasting trillions upon trillions of dollars on the what I call a wealth transfer in the renewable energy space. Well done, Javier, calling it out like he, he called it like it is. Well done. Let's go to California's energy dilemma and how new laws might spark higher, even higher gas prices. The recent closure announcement of Phillips 66 refinery in Los Angeles is just one example of how stringent environmental regulations are driving refineries out of business. With strict rules can, on emissions, operating costs, many California-based refineries can't compete with their cheaper counterparts elsewhere, leading to dwindling number of domestic refining operations. The new law requires oil refineries to remain higher fuel inventories, plan for maintenance outages, and allow the state emergency commission to approve maintenance schedules. Oh, that's what we need. While intended to stabilize gas prices and prevent manipulation, critics argue this could lead to higher storage costs, operational, cons operational constraints. This is really important. California's reliance on foreign oil raises several concerns. I'm going to take it one step further. While China has been increasing their downstream uh, capabilities, they have been increasing their gasoline and diesel. I'm willing to bet and bookmark this that you'll be able to see China importing gasoline and diesel. Who's going to be making money on it? I want to follow the money. Is that money going to go back to Governor Newsom and his reelection campaign? We need to know because the, none of these decisions are made are good for Californians. They are absolutely not good for the environment by having to bring it all the way in. So China is importing in Iranian oil. 
It's coming in all the way from Iran. It goes to the refineries and then the gasoline is going to be shipped to California. That's good for the environment. Or remember, California is still buying 70% of the oil that is produced out of the rainforest. They're stripping the rainforest and they're bringing that oil into California from China. It's all public information. Let's go to Cutter here around the next story. Cutter faces a uh, rising competition in Asia from flexible LNG suppliers. The big thing is short-term and more flexible LNG contracts offered from sellers in the United States, the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, and Oman are challenging Qatar's dominance in LNG uh, gas supply to North Asia, the trade sources told Reuters. Buyers in South Korea and Japan, for example, now prefer the flexibility and the shorter-term deals to procure the LNG. There is a real reason why South Korea and Japan is preferring shorter term contracts is because of the rumblings that they may be getting pipelines from Russia. Imagine if they got pipelines from Russia, they wouldn't even need to be buying that higher priced LNG. This article has a few hidden nuggets in it, and I think it's pretty telling. Last year, Qatar Energy President and CEO Syed Sherdal al Kabi said that 40% of the new LNG that will come to market by 2029 and all our projects are up and running is going to be from Qatar Energy. I had hats off to them. I hope that they are successful, but I think that they're going to have a run for their money as uh, more and more U.S. projects come on board. In fact, Canada is really going to start. I think you're going to see Canada flip and uh, start producing some more as well too so like subscribe share and let us know if you have any news things out there if you're an oil and gas expert i want to talk to you on conversations in energy with uh, Stu turley please have a great day and look forward to visiting with you soon